It's not like any other podcast. Coming to you straight from the heartland, where investing is told like it is. It's time for Darren Garman's Paranoid Banker Podcast. Hold on, because here comes the next episode of the Paranoid Banker Podcast. Hey everybody, Darren Garman here, and welcome to this week's podcast, where we are talking about car loans. Car loans. Now, I know... You're wondering, okay, Garmin, why in the hell are we talking about car loans? I want to talk about real estate, investment real estate, multifamily communities, multifamily investing. I want to grow my IRA, my 401k, I want to, et cetera, et cetera. I want interesting, cutting edge information on investing in multifamily real estate, Mr. Paranoid Banker. And you're right. That's why this will be one of the most important podcast you've listened to from me in a long, long time. Uh, So before I get into the information on why this will be a game changer kind of podcast for you, I believe, let's hit a couple housekeeping items first, okay? Number one, uh, I am recording this podcast today from my home office. So those of you that have been with me at least a while know that I have two partners of mine that like to, uh, shall we say, make themselves known uh, if and when they want to. And those partners of mine are Bosworth and Blue. Okay, Bosworth and Blue are my Shetland sheepdogs. So Bosworth and Blue love to bark at the following people. Mail carriers, UPS people, FedEx people, Grandmothers and grandfathers walking by with strollers and any other kind of threat that they may believe is happening in and around the house. So even though Bosworth and Blue don't join me here in the office, there will be times where you will hear Bosworth and Blue let whomever is either dropping off a package or walking by know that, hey, this is our place. Back off. Go back to where you came from. And so you will hear barking from time to time from Bosworth and Blue. So I wanted you to know about that. Uh, secondly, uh, just a, a reminder, are and, and depending on when you are listening to this and when this is recorded, I know it plays a, a role in what I'm going to tell you at our, about this um, next announcement, but our next multifamily investment summit, uh, which is... Um, only only allow 20 investors into the summit. So very small groups are allowed and that's it. And this is only for serious investors. Our next multifamily investment summit and property tour, live property tour, is going to be on November 18th. And so if you are a serious investor looking to go to and take the next level and get to the next level with your investing, especially if you're one that does not feel you've reached your potential as an investor, uh, you should attend. Uh, there are more. There's more information on this at www.heartlandinvestmentsummit. One word: heartlandinvestmentsummit.com. You will get more information on the agenda, what I cover during our time together, and also information on the property tour. This is only for serious investors. That's why we keep it to 20. This isn't like a big event we're trying to sell out. We're not trying to get butts and seats. Um, This isn't it. This is an intimate time with me showing you how the game is played, what you need to do, how you need to do it in order to take your wealth and income from where it is now to where you want it to be. So again, heartlandinvestmentsummit.com. And if you have any questions on anything there, get in touch with us. Myself or one of my staff will be back in touch with you to answer your question. All right. Now, uh, let's talk about car loans. Car loans. I am looking at the October 2nd edition of the Wall Street Journal. And this is on the front page. And so when you're on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, it's a big deal. I mean, if any of you have read the Wall Street Journal or even looked at it, you know 
there's so much damn information in there. I mean, it, it takes you two hours to get through it if you basically read everything, probably longer. And there's no way you can get through everything every day unless you, A, have nothing else to do, um, or B, you're like on vacation somewhere, you know, and, and just relax. I mean, if you want to be productive during a day, you, you can't start out by reading the journal for three hours. Um, unless you get up at maybe three in the morning. So if you make front page, it's like a big deal. <clears throat> if an article's on the front page, it's a big deal because that's what most people will look at anyway, right? Most people aren't going to page back to A10, you know, page 10 or A10. They're going to page to the um, uh, to the front page. And here is what the article is. Here's the headline on the article, and it reads this. Americans buy cars with piles of debt. Americans buy cars with piles of debt. And here's the subheadline underneath that. Booming financing, stretched out loans are signs of middle class indebtedness. I'll say it again. Stretched out loans are signs of middle class indebtedness. Okay? So I want to I want that to sink in with you just for a moment. Okay, so I want you to think about that. Okay. <clears throat> and now I'm going to take a couple of uh, sentences out of this article, and we're going to expand on this and, and how this is how and why this is a big deal. And at the beginning of the podcast, I said this could be one of those game changer kind of podcasts for you. We'll talk about why that's the case. Here we go. Walk into any auto dealership these days, and you might walk out with a seven year car loan. Okay. That means monthly payments that last well past when the brake pads give out and potentially beyond when the car gets traded in for a new one. About a third of auto loans for new vehicles in the first half of 2019 had terms longer than six years, according to Experian Credit Bureau. So, folks, what that means is the first half of 2019, well over 30% of car loans had seven-year terms or longer. Now, Maybe you don't think that's significant. Listen to this little stat. A decade ago, that number was less than 10%. Say it again. A decade ago, that number was less than 10%. Okay? Here's the punchline of the entire article, and it's really in one sentence. American middle-class buyers can't afford a middle-class lifestyle. Incomes have risen at a sluggish pace in the past decade, but car prices have grown rapidly. I'll read that last part again. Incomes have risen at a sluggish pace in the past decade, but car prices have grown rapidly. So, now what does this mean other than um, people need longer car loans, car loans with longer terms in order for their cash flows to Makes sense month after month. You know, their daily cares of life, cash flow, income out, you know, income in, expenses out, daily cares of living. What this means is, as I've been saying now going on, I don't know, four or five years, that the cost of living is going up at a dramatically faster pace than wages are. Okay, so, so far, what we've talked about isn't all that revealing, is it? I mean, this is all stuff that most of us, I think we pretty much know. But here's the, where the rubber meets the road on this, pun intended. Everybody needs a car, pretty much. Okay, now, yeah, you can make the argument, you know, those that live like in big city, let's say Manhattan, New York, Manhattan, um... L.A. I mean, yeah, there are there are many folks that can use and don't have vehicles. They just use public transportation or they walk wherever they're going. And aside from the folks that might ride their bike to work once in a while, car, you know, maybe uh, take the moped or the scooter. Pretty much everybody needs a vehicle, needs a car. And on top of that. Most middle American households have more than one car. So, you know, this article right now is just talking about one car. Well, we know most people have at least two, don't we? 
most Americans probably have two cars. Um, so there was a time when out in front of our house here, There'd be five vehicles, and if friends were over, we had like eight vehicles in front of our house, in our driveway in front of our house. So you had Gina's car, my vehicle, the three kids' vehicles, and then if they had a few friends over, I mean, it looked like, you know, I had a buddy of mine that would would uh, uh, poke fun at me and say, yeah, I drove by your house today, it looks like you're selling cars. I mean, it looks, it looks like a car lot out there. Um, and that's just, you know, family, three kids. Um that's not, you know, two people, you know, a couple people living together, a couple people married, a couple people married with kids. So I would tell you that most probably have more than one vehicle. And what this article says is most people have to stretch their loan payments out because of two reasons. Number one, they don't have the cash to pay for the car. They don't have the cash to just write a check. Okay? That's significant. And I'll tell you why in a second. Number two, in order for them to make ends meet in their daily cares of life, the loan payments have to be smaller, which means the loans need to be stretched out longer. And so when you combine that with the fact that most people need a vehicle, again, there's a tiny percentage that ride the bus and and do all that and ride the subways and, and all that kind of stuff. Most people need a vehicle. Because really, number two, uh, maybe number three. So if you kind of go hierarchy for folks, place to live, <clears throat> food, clothing, car. And with some people, car might be number two because you got to get to work in order to buy the food and clothing. You got to get to work to pay for the roof over your head. Uh, and most people need transportation to get to where they need to go work-wise and, and, and you know, 400 other things you need a vehicle to do. And if you've ever been without a vehicle, let's say you've um, had a vehicle repaired, uh, it's in the shop for a couple of days getting some work, maybe you're in a fender bender and the body shop's got it, you know what it's like when you don't have a vehicle. It's like, holy shit, the world kind of stops if you don't have a vehicle to get somewhere. So here's my question for you. Do you think that the prices of vehicles will go down or level off? No, they're going to continue to go up. Right? I mean, I don't know how you can argue with me on that because that's what's going to happen. So not only do most Americans, especially middle class Americans, especially most people that rent or will be renting, not only do they need a vehicle, the cost of those vehicles will continue to climb. Right? Um, continue to climb which will put more strain on their cash flow because, again, their wages go up slower than the cost of things like vehicles. Uh, and I'm not even throwing wild cards in there, guys, like what you got to pay to maintain the vehicle, repairs, maintenance, oil changes, new tires, insurance. I'm not even throwing that in there. So you may as well throw that in there now, too. Most people's cash flows are going to be dedicated to their vehicles. A large percentage of income that most Americans make are going to be directed towards a vehicle or vehicles in some way, shape, or form. As number two, under shelter and clothing. Again, I could argue you can make clothing in cars like two or three. Do you think this trend will continue to go up, continue to balloon like this, or do you think something will happen where this trend will stop and go down? We know that it, it's not going to go down, don't we? I don't know how it can. Manufacturers, car prices will continue to grow. Insurance will continue to grow and get more expensive. Repairs and maintenance will continue to grow. So what do you think most people will be faced with when it comes to their monthly income, being able to live, have vehicles, and then maybe have some other things hopefully on top of that? Food, recreation, 
Um, and I can, I, the list could be long. Where do you think these people are going to go and where do you think they're going to live? Do you think these people are now going to own their own home? Do you think they're going to go buy their own home or condo? No, they won't. Some will. Some do. And I'm not saying that it's blanket, that everybody will do this. But what do you think the majority of people will do with their living arrangements with just this subject of car loans in mind? Where are they going to live? You're right. They're going to live in apartments. They're going to live in the most affordable place they can and do, do that as much as they can without sacrificing lifestyle. Because again, when you own your own home or condo, not only do you have to qualify to buy it, which if, if you can't scrape up enough cash to buy a car, how are you going to qualify to buy your own home or condo? Um, then once you own it, you've got the maintenance of that. Repairs, maintenance, new roof, new carpet, new flooring, utility costs, property taxes, insurance, and I could go on and on. So everything I've said, just kind of mix it around for a minute. Just kind of, you know, in like a picture in your mind, like a bowl, and we're mixing this all around. And we empty that bowl out. That bowl is going to be emptied into multifamily communities, folks. That's where all of this is now. So we are seeing this happen now. This is not something that's going to happen, even though it will continue to happen and grow exponentially. It's happening now. Now. Uh, and you will continue to see more and more, not only middle class, but also boomers and other Americans choose to rent versus buy. Again, is everybody going to do that? No. There will be people that will buy. There will be people that will continue to do that. And that's going to happen. I'm not saying it's going to just stop. But the pendulum, folks, is swinging so far over to the rent versus the own area and will continue to swing even more and more in that direction over the coming years than probably I think it will. So the question is, what will you do about this? Because this is almost like <clears throat> insider trading. You know, there, 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 you could, we, we've, most of us have heard names of folks that have been busted for insider trading. Um, you know, you do research, you come up with a long list of people, some famous, some not so famous, that, you know, made millions, hundreds of millions of dollars insider trading. And insider trading is basically sharing secret information or classified information. I use classified. That's not really the right word. But using um, information uh, that can get you a gain, a tremendous gain on your investment that nobody else knows about. Right? Proprietary information that nobody else knows. And using it to profit in a big, big way. Well, this is insider information, folks, but it, it's really not. This is like legal insider information because we know what's going on. We see it in front of us right now, right now. So it's almost like having legal insider information. Okay, now that you've got that insider information, what are you going to do? Because here's what's here's what's frustrating for me. Um, and, and, and I'm not putting you in a box, but I just want you to know that here's what most people will do. So if, if I, if I was your cousin, Bill or uncle Bill, and I called you up and I said, Hey, buddy of mine owns XYZ company. And he just told me they're going public in four days. And here's like the five things that you need to know. Here's what's going on in the background and why their public IPO is just going to explode. So find your stockbroker, buy as much stock in this as you can. You'll be freaking rich. Okay. What will you do when you get that phone call? All right. Most of you will then, you know, hey, Uncle Bill, okay. You'll get a hold of somebody 
to start buying at least some stock, as much as you probably can, but at least some stock in this company before the IPO, and you will profit from this insider information. You'll do it. Especially if it's coming from Uncle Bill. Yeah, a buddy of mine owns this company. It's going public. Here's like five. I just want you to, you can make some good money on this. And most people would do something with that information that they hear about. Um, you know, another really bad analogy is, you know, you go, if, if you're into like horse racing and, you know, you're sitting at a, at a, um, at a bar with some guy and, you know, he's talking about the big race tomorrow and why this one horse is going to win all the races and here's what's going on. And more than likely you're tempted to at least go bet on the horses, even if you've never done it, um, just to see if you can make a little bit of money. So most people under this scenario would at least do something, see if they can make a little bit of money. Some people, a lot of money. But when it comes to seeing this information now right in front of us, no one's given us this. This isn't like someone secretly told you. This is happening in front of us now. We see this going on in front of us. What are you going to do with that information? What frustrates the shit out of me is most people aren't going to do anything with it. It's like getting insider information legally and not doing anything with it. Watching. Watching. That's what most people will do. That's what most people will do. Um, and so this is not a, 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 a me getting on a soapbox saying that, you know, how, how dare you not do this and, and how can you be so stupid as not to? That's not my point. My point is, it's in front of you. It's right there. You're look, I mean, it's in... Freaking black and white right here. It's happening. And what will most people do? Nothing. Nothing. And then wonder five years from now, geez, I sure wish I could have done X, Y, or Z. Sure wish I could have bought my grandkids this or helped them out with their tuition to go there or my wife and I to do this, or my significant and other and I to do that, or to give this much to my university, that I could go on and on. So what will you do with this information? Because folks, here's what's happening. As a result of all of these things, and we've just talked about car loans today, the line for people to continue to want to and have to rent is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. Then, at the same time, the line for investors, especially Wall Street type folks, that line up to want to buy what we have so they can get in on this, so they can profit from this. Do you think that will get less or do you think that will grow? That's right. That will grow. And really, to me, the more exciting thing is not so much the line of tenants. It's the line of investors wanting to buy and own what we have or what people have when they own their own multifamily communities, which will just, I mean, the value of these properties will increase at a significant rate, significantly. And we're seeing it already in some sectors. So, we've covered quite a bit on this podcast, even though we just talked about car loans, haven't we? And so, really, what I would leave you with today on today's podcast is just to have you think. Think about what are you going to do about this? This is going on in front of you. This is pretty much like legal insider trading. You've got the information. The research is out there in front of you to find and to look into and to know. Your Uncle Bill didn't have to call you with this tip. It's right there for you. What will you do with it? What will you do with it? Um, it has been a pleasure being with you on today's podcast. Um, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, I always love to hear from you um, related to this podcast and what we covered today or not. 
So my contact information is all over the place. Uh, stick around and you'll hear how to get a hold of me quicker if you want to. And um, I appreciate you being with me today. Have a great day. Have a great week or weekend whenever you've listened to me. And um, next time you think about or see anything to do with a car loan, think about what we have talked about today. All right. Take care. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining Darren Garman's Paranoid Banker Podcast. For investment questions, comments, or to get in touch with Darren, go to www.garmanblog.com. Thanks for joining Darren Garman's Paranoid Banker Podcast. For investment questions, comments, or to get in touch with Darren, go to www.garmanblog.com.